Hi, my name is Scott Burley. I work for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I'll be talking to you for a while about Interplanetary Overlay Network, which is an implementation of the Delay Tolerant Networking, or DTN, architecture. The training will be in four sessions. Interspersed between those sessions will be hands-on exercises. Uh, the general structure of the training looks like this. There's plenty of uh, theory to talk about, both of delay tolerant networking in general and ION in particular. There are kickstarting and wrap-up elements to the sessions. Uh, there are hands-on exercises. There won't be any Q&A, but if you do have questions, uh, feel free to send me email. My email address is on the first slide of this presentation. The theoretical knowledge that we'll be covering uh, includes um, these things here. We'll talk a little bit about space communication challenges in general. Uh, we'll go over the history of delay tolerant networking and its features and the benefits of, of DTN. We'll uh, then move into the history of the ION implementation itself, its architecture, its overall structure, the uh, functions that it performs, uh, the design principles and constraints that explain the way it's built the way it's built, uh, some uh, discussion of resource management, which is a key problem in DTN. And we'll also cover uh, some concepts in network operations. We'll discuss the convergence layer adapters that ION supports, and we'll uh, summarize the functional modules of ION so that you can know what kinds of uh, capabilities are provided in the software. There will be hands-on applications that will be uh, uh, the, the exercises in between the lecture sessions. And during those uh, application sessions, you will be able to demonstrate a, a simple ION application, configure a network, uh, learn something about troubleshooting a network, uh, some uh, practical information. And, and if uh, all goes well and you have some time, then we might even be able to develop a new application uh, while the training is going on. At the end of the training, you should be able to understand the key principles of the architecture of ION. You should uh, be able to integrate theoretical knowledge of ION into your thinking about design for uh, space flight missions. Um, you should be able to maintain ION infrastructure and uh, develop software applications based on uh, the ION libraries. In this first session, which nominally we would do in, in the morning of the first day of a, a multi-day course, uh, we will talk about uh, space communications in general, just as an overview, internet communications and how that relates to space communications, and, um, and from that derive the motivation for interplanetary internet thinking and the architecture of delay tolerant networking and how that looks forward toward uh, eventual establishment of a solar system internet. So what are we talking about? Well, the long-term goal of the training is to enable you to use interplanetary overlay network software, um, but uh, it's an implementation of DTN and it's not easy to understand what ION is doing or why it's doing it without knowing something about DTN itself. So we plan to start there. So here's an overview of what we'll be covering in this introduction to delay tolerant networking. Uh, uh, an overview of space communications, uh, an overview of internet communications, uh, how DTN relates those two together, uh, a brief history of the thinking behind design of a solar system internet, how DTN and uh, internet protocol uh, compare, what the features and benefits of DTN are. So, an overview of space communications. Communication with spacecraft in general is challenging. Communication with an interplanetary spacecraft is challenging because of the distances involved, the very long signal propagation delays, uh, the high rates of data loss due to radio signal interference. Communication even with 
spacecraft in near Earth space, Earth orbit, is challenging because of the orbital movement of the satellites, uh, the link handovers, the acquisition and, and loss of uh, signal as satellites come into and out of visibility of ground antenna, and discontinuous vehicle operations. DTN is NASA's solution for reliable automated network communications in space missions. And this is a, a, a point where I can say something about what I think network means in this context. It is always possible to engineer communication between a point on Earth and a point on, in space. The difference between the communication with space vehicles that we've been doing for many years and a, an automated network of communication protocols is exactly the fact that it's automated. The fact that it's automated, that the protocols automatically perform many of the functions that would otherwise have to be uh, commanded by mission operators, enables the cost and uh, effort involved in communication with the spacecraft to be reduced. That in turn enables the number of spacecraft you can communicate with to be increased and enables the fleet of deep space spacecraft to increase. And that's particularly timely because space is becoming uh, heavily populated as we speak and being able to scale up communication among large numbers of space vehicles is going to become increasingly important over the next decades. To give you a sense of the kinds of signal propagation latencies we're facing in space communications, uh, here's uh, an animation. The round trip time, the time to send signal and get an answer back between two points on the internet ranges between 100 and 300 milliseconds. Uh, if it's going through a, a geo satellite, uh, the latency is much longer, although it's still not huge. It's on the order of 480 to 550, 560 milliseconds. The distance to the space station, uh, the International Space Station ISS, through Tedris is about 71,000 kilometers. Uh, the round trip time to Tedris, typically around 1,200 milliseconds using the KU length. Um, the distance to the moon is a little over 384,000 kilometers. So the round trip time is on the order of 2,560 milliseconds, a little over two and a half seconds round trip time. The minimum distance to Mars, 54.6 million kilometers, the round trip time increases there to over 300,000 milliseconds, a little bit over six minutes. The average distance to Mars is about 225 million kilometers. That means that the average round trip time for communication with an entity at Mars is about 25 minutes, sending a signal and getting a signal back. And the farthest distance is uh, about 400 million kilometers. So the round trip time increases to uh, almost 45 minutes, almost 45 minutes to send a signal and get an answer back.
communication with spacecraft in deep space is very different from communication on Earth. The communication opportunities are not continuous. Uh, they are scheduled based on the dynamics of the orbits of the vehicles we're talking to and the operation plans of those vehicles. Uh, sometimes a spacecraft is on the far side of a planet and you can't communicate with it. Sometimes you may have it in view but its antenna may be pointed toward the planet because its body fixed and the spacecraft is doing um, uh, science investigation on, on the planet and can't communicate at that time. So the transmission and reception episodes are individually configured, started and ended, typically by command sent to the spacecraft and, and commands conveyed to the deep space network tracking stations and uh, communication uh, complexes um, at uh, Canberra and Goldstone and Madrid. Um, the spacecraft transmits directly to the ground, the ground transmits directly to the spacecraft. The reliability of transmission over these links is by management. That is, if there's a loss of data, that absence of data is detected by the mission operations team on the ground and commands are sent. Either, either the commands that were lost on, in transit to the spacecraft are retransmitted or or new commands are sent to the spacecraft to, to retransmit the telemetry that was lost. More recently, for the Mars missions, uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, the Mars uh, Surface Laboratory, we've had managed forwarding through a relay point. So the data from these surface vehicles is relayed through Odyssey, MRO, and um, other uh, orbiting Mars vehicles. So what's wrong with that? Uh, certainly the mission communications model that we've been using for the last 40 years or more has worked fine. We've done a lot of very good science with the deep space spacecraft. But the status quo has a couple of problems. It is uh, labor intensive. The communication operations cost actually ends up being a fairly substantial fraction of the budget for a mission. The risk of human error m means that you have to uh, implement mitigations that increase uh, cost even further. And it's program limiting, partly because the cost and risk increases uh, are uh, uh, prohibitive as the number of links between communicating ent entities increases. Uh, and as the crosslinks among spacecraft become more common, things like the Mars network and ultimately um, lunar networks, um, the cost and risk increases are nonlinear with the increase in the number of spacecraft. It becomes exponential. And there is an alternative. Uh, networks, such as the internet, automate these complex communications. The internet is used today to conduct science and scientific investigations. We're already building an internet of things, so why not use it for deep space science missions as well? And, and as, as we do that, we can minimize the cost because there are uh, plenty of off-the-shelf um, um, instruments and uh, routers that we can use to automate communication in the internet. And the risk is minimal because the installed base is gigantic. And the answer to that question is that the internet itself is not really up to the job of um, managing a network in deep space for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's, it's based on assumptions that the network nodes are continuously connected, that the networks have got short signal propagation delays, that the data links are symmetric, roughly, and bidirectional, that the bit error rates are relatively low. We expect uh, internet signals to be traveling over cables and, and uh, fiber optics. Um, these assumptions are not valid in the space environment, so a new sort of network is needed. In the space environment, uh, connections can be routinely interrupted. It's normal for end-to-end -end communications to be interrupted for minutes or hours or sometimes days. Uh, there are interplanetary distances that impose very long delays that make it difficult to operate the internet protocols, which expect very uh, short round trip times. There are uh, asymmetric link data rates. Some of the links, in fact, are simplex. They're not even bidirectional. At some 
parts of, of, of uh, operational cycles, spacecraft may only be able to send and not receive. And the bit error rates can be very high. So don't we already have a space network? Yes, we do. We have um, uh, actually quite a few space networks. NASA manages three of them, uh, consisting of distributed ground stations, space relay satellites. Um, and they support both NASA and non-NASA missions, uh, the Deep Space Network, the Near Earth Network, and the Space Network. Uh, other national space agencies operate their own networks, and there are a growing number of commercially operated networks, too, such as uh, Amazon. And uh, here's a, um, a picture of the Near-Earth Network map. They're, it's uh, very capable. There are uh, tracking stations, ground stations uh, all around the planet, and um, orbiting satellites can be uh, in view of one or another of of these ground stations uh, pretty much all the time. And so for low Earth orbit in particular, it seemed that there's no problem, right? The distances are quite short. Uh, the spacecraft are only a few hundred miles up. The uh, error rates are high, but they're uh, not intolerably high. And there's plenty of coverage. So it would seem that for low Earth uh, satellite communications, we don't need anything more than what we already have, and possibly we could just use the internet. Except that's not completely true. For communication between a ground station and a low Earth orbiting satellite that's passing directly overhead, yeah, the distances are very short, data error rates are um, low, you could use the internet protocols for communication between the two. If, uh, you just take some time to set up a, uh, to establish a session and, and then you can use uh, TCP IP be between the satellite and the ground station for that brief interval. For continuous connectivity, continuous communication with low earth orbiting satellites, you would need ground stations in many more places than they exist already. Uh, in the absence of that very large population of ground stations, what uh, the International Space Station in low Earth orbit uses is communication through the TDRS relay satellites in geosynchronous orbit. Those are always in view, and um, the uh, data rate that they can support is quite high, and so the space station can be in generally continuous communication with mission control in Houston. However, the round trip latency through the TDRS satellites is lengthy because TDRS is in uh, very high orbit, uh, typically over a second of round trip time. And so reliable high rate communication is hard to achieve. And, and beyond that, the loss of signal and acquisition of, cy uh, acquisition of signal cycles um, th th that are resulting whenever the ISS leaves contact with one TDRS and enters contact with, with another TDRS, um, th those handovers interrupt the end-to-end -end connections and, and, and will cause large file transfers to fail. They'll require special uh, scheduling and scripting to, uh, to, to enable uh, data to transfer without being lost during the handovers. Uh, any any data that need to be transmitted during a loss of signal period have to be uh, stored someplace and retransmitted, and that retransmission needs to be commanded. You can engineer around all of this stuff, but even if you did, these are closed networks of bent pipe link repeaters only. They're not true networks. They don't include the endpoints that are the users of the network, uh, the instruments, the science scientific workstations. Uh, they don't reach end to end from a principal investigator's laboratory in Wisconsin to an instrument on board the space station. They are uh, limited to the links between the satellites and the ground stations. For truly automated end to end communication with vehicles in space, what's needed is a new internet, 
expanding the solar system. Fortunately, we've got a terrific model for the capabilities that we would want to expect from this solar system network, and that is the internet itself. And so to understand the motivation for some of the design decisions in dilettante networking and uh, motivating the solar system internet, it's probably helpful to do a quick review of the architecture of the internet. I expect a lot of people taking this training already know a lot about the internet, so I will try to cover these concepts uh, kind of quickly. Um, it's a key concept that we need to work with uh, throughout the discussion of uh, network architecture is this concept of a protocol stack. Uh, in the design of a network, we allocate different network communication functions to different protocols, and those protocols work in a, in a nested fashion so that each of the, the, the protocols uses the services of, of, of others and provides services to, to other um, so other protocols as well. And when we represent those relationships in a stack where each layer of the stack corresponds to a, a function, a, a layer of, of uh, uh, functionality, the uh, lower layers of the stack provide functionality to the layers above them. In a protocol stack diagram, each layer of the diagram identifies the protocol that performs the function at that layer. And, and as such, it relies on the services of the layer below it and provides service to the layer above it. And so for the internet protocol, the, uh, the stack functionality looks like this. And this is uh, adapted from the more familiar uh, seven layer OSI uh, protocol stack. Uh, the application protocols at the top, uh, transport protocols, typically TCP, network protocols, typically IP, uh, data link protocols, and there's a wide variety of those, and then physical protocols that convey the frames of the data link protocols. The stacking of protocols is um, conveniently reflected in the structure of the protocol data units that get transmitted over the network, and that's that's because uh, as a uh, as information arrives at a, a node of the network. It, uh, it is handled first by the lowest layer of the stack and then by successively higher uh, layers. And so the, the information that, that the lowest layer of the stack needs needs to be at the front of the protocol data unit. And, and that's the structure that we typically see as um, data are transmitted over the network. And so in this particular case, we've got uh, uh, domain name service at the application layer, UDP at the transport layer, IP at the network layer, uh, FDDI at the data link layer, and, and this, this is FDDI running over optical fiber. And each FDDI frame has a, an FDDI header and, and then its um, payload, which is an IP packet. The IP packet has an IP header and its payload is a UDP datagram. Uh, the datagram has a UDP header and its payload is the DNS message. Um, in a nutshell, uh, the functionality of the network looks a little bit like this. There are, uh, in this case, uh, a very simplified uh, network uh, representation where there are four nodes in the network. Uh, the uh, protocol stack at the hosts at each end uh, goes all the way up to the application. Uh, there are routers in between the the two hosts, and those router protocol those those router elements. Uh, the protocol stack only goes up as high as the uh, network protocol. There's no need for uh, the transport and application protocols to be running in the routers. They only run at the ends of the system, at, at the ends of the path. Uh, there is a, a fundamental concept in uh, internet uh, architecture, which is that uh, it's based on packet switching rather than circuit switching. Uh, the uh, individual bits of data may go in multiple directions over multiple paths rather than always over a single dedicated path. And that enables uh, a better use of available resources, it, uh, this multiplexing of uh, of, of data across multiple paths and, uh, and, and sharing of paths across 
um, of, across multiple conversations uh, makes the fabric uh, more efficient. Um, but it introduces the possibility of congestion and loss when you don't have dedicated circuits. Um, and it, it relies on a fundamental concept that the edges of the network, those hosts, are, are smart and the, the core is doesn't have to be quite as smart, but it needs to be very fast. So the the smarts in the system are located at the at the edges, uh, the at the ends where TCP is and where the applications are, and uh, uh, most of what goes on at the routers in between is uh, high speed and relatively simple and optimized for high speed. Um, the Internet Protocol um, unites individual networks into an inner network. Um, there is a concept of autonomous systems, which are uh, collections of network nodes that are uh, administratively uh, unified and uh, um, and have defined uh, boundaries that uh, are established by uh, peering agreements. And um, in stressed environments, there are performance issues in this architecture. It, when the physical infrastructure is um, is, is sound, it is not disturbed, and there's uh, and, and congestion is kept under control. Performance is very good. Uh, when those conditions no longer obtain, performance can be degraded. Um, so here are some of the assumptions and, 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 and consequent architectural decisions in the internet uh, architecture. It, it's assumed that if you can get from from a source to a destination, then you can get there along a continuously available path. The expectation is that uh, the source and the destination are both on Earth. They're quite close because everything on Earth is uh, close to everything else in, in terms of uh, light seconds because everything is traveling at the speed of light. Uh, the network topology changes relatively slowly because uh, the, the nodes of the network are uh, located in buildings and the buildings don't move. Uh, the latency is low because everything is close together. The round trip times are uh, very low and therefore round trips are, uh, are inexpensive in, in terms of the, the cost required to uh, accomplish functionality in the network. And the packet loss rates are relatively low because you're using uh, high-speed fiber or um, um, uh, copper cables. Uh, and, and so the consequent internet architectural decisions are that packet switching, statistical multiplexing will work great. Sometimes there'll be loss and you recover from it. That you'll have um, slow but very smart edge devices and fast, dumb core devices. If you need to know something from somewhere else, you can ask. There's this um, client-server model of, um, of, of communication that is uh, uh, widely uh, used within the Internet architecture. There are uh, servers that are the repositories of information, and everybody else who doesn't need to store that information locally can obtain it rapidly by querying a server. Because the topology of the network changes relatively slowly, each of the nodes of the network can be identified by its address, its location in the topology of the network. And the um, internet protocol addressing mechanisms are based on that uh, idea. The names are the addresses and you can infer the path to take to uh, reach a, a particular destination address by looking at the prefix of uh, and matching the prefix of the destination node to the prefixes of your uh, local interfaces and selecting the one that matches. And that can be performed, as, as this diagram shows, it, it can be performed at multiple stages of the network. And so the routing can be very rapid uh, because the, uh, the, the routing decisions are made virtually for you in the 
names of the nodes themselves, which are the addresses. And that's important because the internet is very big. Um, even though there are billions of internet uh, devices, the number of uh, uh, entries in the Border Gateway Protocol uh, tables that are that are needed in order to accomplish the routing through the network is relatively small on the order of um, um, three quarters of a, of a million entries because of the uh, embedded uh, locality in the names of the nodes. But that introduces some issues, right? The node nodes are are, uh, are expected to be uh, generally uh, non dynamic in, in location, expected to stay in the same place as we move into an era where more and more uh, nodes are mobile, their locations within the network, within the network topology, may need to change and that is a, a problem for, um, uh, for making the, the, the routing system work properly. We've engineered around that. Uh, we have uh, mobile IP uh, on our uh, phones all the time. Uh, but there is a, a continuous revising of network architecture required to do that. And that only works because the uh, communication is very rapid within the network. Uh, the uh, propagation of changes in network topology is very quick. Uh, there are also issues with multi-homing. What if, what if a particular node wants two different names? Two different addresses. Uh, how do you how do you accomplish that? The internet engineering is um, active and it solves problems like this all the time, and it's able to do so because of the character of the network. The uh, distances are short. The uh, data uh, error rates are relatively low, and so the kinds of protocols that the internet relies on to make everything work, work just fine. Um, the routing uh, is partitioned between uh, interior gateway protocols and um, exterior gateway protocols at the boundaries of uh, autonomous regions. That enables the topology to scale up uh, rapidly. And, um, and, and the discovery of neighbors in your autonomous region is uh, readily accommodated and the, the routing then can be relatively immediate. You can learn the ne network topology quickly, build forwarding tables and, and you forward based on that topology until something breaks and then the topology gets updated and you, and you, you change, you, you, you route a different way. The reliability of data delivery in the network um, for many, many years has been primarily based on TCP. Uh, the TCP protocol uh, provides a, a service of um, a byte stream delivery that is reliable uh, in order and without duplicates. It's based on uh, uh, acknowledgments between the um, the receiver of information, the, 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 the destination and the source. There's flow control built into TCP itself so, so that uh, congestion in the internet can be uh, limited. Um, and, um, and, and there are innumerable applications built on the TCP IP uh, infrastructure. There are important points to keep in mind here. One is that the state has to be synchronized in order for the um, connections to be started and, and ended. Uh, sessions have to be uh, have to be established. There, there has to be a, 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 um, a negotiation to open a connection. And that relies on very brief uh, round trip times. Uh, state is retained at the endpoints and um, and, and if there are um, problems in the network, that state information is not available 
to relay nodes that are at intermediate points in the network. It's that information is available at, at the ends rather than uh, generally rather than uh, in the routers. And so uh, when environments are stressed, there can be performance issues. In particular, as environmental constraints become more severe, the performance of TCP uh, drops off rapidly, as, a, as you can see from this diagram, uh, increases in uh, round trip time and decreases in bit error rate, uh, especially in, in combination, uh, drop the throughput of TCP connections uh, from uh, uh, very high rates to extremely low rates. Um, the UDP uh, protocol, because it doesn't uh, rely on uh, acknowledgments in the same way that uh, TCP does and is not window-based the same way, is uh, not affected by these kinds of um, constraints nearly as much. Uh, really, not at all. Uh, but, of course, it also does not accomplish what TCP does. It doesn't uh, accomplish reliable transmission, and it doesn't achieve congestion control. I've spoken several times about the end-to-end -end, uh, nature of reliability in the Internet and the requirement for continuous end-to-end -end, uh, connectivity in order for the uh, intelligence that's located at the end systems to be able to manage communication properly in the network. Uh, the, the impact of that design decision is brought out in this diagram here. Um, at the top, we see uh, a, an example of uh, transmission from a source node to a destination node through three relay nodes and um, in, in, in the internet. And we're showing in the horizontal uh, dimension, we're showing uh, time. And what we're seeing here is that the transmissions from the source um, really cannot begin until uh, way over here at the end, uh, when there is finally uh, connectivity from end to end, because all of the uh, nodes that are in the uh, that are relays in the network, the, the links from those nodes to the source and the des destination and the links among themselves are all up at the same time. And so what that means is that the period during which data can be transmitted is quite small, and the latency before the first hunk of data that's transmitted can arrive is, is quite long. Uh, and sort of a preview of what we do in DTN, here's a, this, the same sort of diagram with the same um, sort of uh, connectivity constraints uh, using DTN. And here, because DTN does not require that um, links be up continuously between the source and the destination, because the, the intelligence of the network is not limited to the edge nodes, but is, is actually embedded in these uh, relay nodes as well, the, the data can begin to flow right away. And so uh, data transmitted here can flow to, uh, to this node uh, pretty much right away. It then has to wait until this node has an opportunity to send to the next node. Then it has to wait until this node has an opportunity to send to the next node down here. And the latency before the first bit of information arrives is, is only this length of time rather than this length of time. And because that continues throughout all this period, there are multiple episodes of uh, data arrival, and so the total throughput is higher because th there are more opportunities to get data through the network. In, in the internet, this kind of uh, highly disconnected operation is supposed to not be happening. That's not what the internet is designed for. In spaceflight communications, happens all the time. And that's why this sort of a scenario is uh, closer to what we would want to do in internet and space. So summing up, the internet is 
as terrific as it is for communication on Earth, it is usable for low Earth orbit, but it's not ideal um, in the event that you have to go through Tedris. Uh, it's still long round trip times, which reduces data rates and uh, the loss of signal and acquisition of, sig of signal cycles are expensive and really isn't usable for deep space. TCP is just not suitable. The uh, round trip times needed to establish a, a connection could uh, between here and Mars could take so much uh, time that the communication opportunity would be done by the time the connection was opened. Uh, there's no alternative internet standard for reliable transmission that would work over deep space links and so there are no standards for flow control and congestion control that are provided by the internet protocols and that means that none of the standard routing protocols would work because uh, BGP, for example, relies on TCP and, and the other routing protocols rely on timers. Um, the, 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 routing in, in the routing protocols in, in internet uh, regard a, a, a network partition as a problem that needs to be uh, addressed by routing around the, the, the interruption in, in connectivity. And in, um, in deep space, those transient network partitions are uh, uh, nominal. They're, you expect them to happen all the time. They are, they are not changes in network topology. And that means that none of the routers that you can buy off the shelf would work. Uh, interruption of, uh, of an outbound link must cause outbound traffic to be queued instead of discarded, it, it, which is what routers would typically do when the outbound link is down. So if, if you strike all those things out of the um, uh, the internet protocol technology base. What you're left with is UDP/IP with static routing, and uh, and that is really just a somewhat less bit efficient alternative to using raw CCSDS packets. So, um, based on this kind of analysis, we concluded that a new sort of network was needed. And that's what DTN, Dilettante Network, is all about. Work on delay tolerant networking began in 1998. The group that evolved into the Interplanetary Networking Research Group of the Internet Research Task Force uh, began uh, discussing the uh, issues in interplanetary uh, communications back in 1998 in, in January at uh, a meeting in uh, Washington uh, at uh, MCI Worldcom headquarters. Um, since then, um, the f funding for development of the ideas came uh, partly from NASA, partly from DARPA. Uh, since the mid-2000s, the DTN development has been led primarily by NASA. Um, up until very recently, uh, uh, with a few years ago, uh, an uh, Internet Engineering Task Force working group for DTN was formed. And uh, NASA has been uh, active in that uh, working group, but uh, is no longer the, uh, the only developer of uh, DTN uh, concepts and technology, certainly. Uh, in 2010, the Interagency Operations Advisory Group, uh, which is a, a consortium of uh, national space agencies, uh, reviewed the material that had been generated in DTN research over the preceding uh, uh, 12 years and uh, determined that they would recommend a timely evolution toward a, a fully functional solar system internet based on DTN as a as a core service. So here's a, 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 a one-page pitch on what DTN is. It's a digital communication network technology that enables data to be conveyed reliably among communicating entities when round trip times may be highly variable and or very long for whatever reasons. Uh, very uh, long because of extremely long signal propagation delays, uh, very long because 
of a, an interruption in communication that uh, uh, can't be remedied until later in time. Uh, the data transmission uh, in this network is done automatically and reliably, even if one or more of the links in the end-to-end -end path is subject to very long signal propagation, propagation latency uh, and or prolonged periods of unavailability. Some terminology. Uh, a DTN node is an engine for sending and receiving data. Uh, it's an implementation of the DTN bundle protocol. And uh, a node on um, a bundle protocol where the name comes from, uh, uh, the original idea there was that because round trip times in a DTN are very long, negotiation is a bad idea. And so the transmission of data from from one node to another, ideally should carry with it as much metadata as is needed to enable the receiving node to make sense of and, and use the received data. And so that, that bundling of the data with necessary metadata uh, was, was a fundamental characteristic of the protocol and, and resulted in the, the name of bundle protocol. Um, applications utilize DTN nodes to send or receive application data units uh, that are carried in bundles. Bundles are the protocol data units of, of the bundle protocol. Uh, each node is a member of one or more groups that are called DTN endpoints. A DTN endpoint is a set of DTN nodes. However, all, I would say maybe most DTN nodes uh, occupy multiple endpoints and most DTN endpoints uh, contain only a single node. Uh, as, a, as a first order uh, model, you could think of a DTN endpoint as, um, as being uh, analogous to a socket address. And uh, you can think of a, a DTN node as being functionally analogous to a, a host or, or a router in, in, in the network. A bundle is considered to have been successfully delivered to a, a DTN endpoint or actually at a DTN endpoint when some minimum subset of the nodes in the endpoint has received the bundle without error. Um, if the endpoint is a singleton endpoint that has only a single node in it, then, uh, then delivery to that node is, uh, it, it, it is what constitutes successful delivery of the bundle. Bundles are forwarded from a storage place on one node to a storage place on another node along a path that eventually reaches the destination. The storage is important because, as we saw from the diagram before, uh, the connectivity is not guaranteed to be continuous, which means that in order for data to advance through the network, uh, since they can't be transmitted because the connectivity is not there, they have to be stored. So the intermediate nodes on the path from the source to the destination need storage resources to be able to hold on to data until a forward um, tr transmission opportunity arises. Um, DTN uses this model to overcome the problems associated with intermittent connectivity and uh, so on that we've been talking about. Uh, each forwarding node stores bundles locally within the network, not at the source, until they've been received by the next node in the path. And that's a key concept. Uh, unlike uh, TCP IP in the internet, where the point of retransmission is always the source host, uh, in DTN, the point of retransmission may very well be, and often is, uh, inside the network. That is the the, the forwarding nodes, the th things that act like routers in a DTN, are uh, able to uh, retransmit data that get lost in the uh, in a transmission from from one node to the next. Uh, DTN protocols rely on underlying convergence layer protocols for physical transmission of data between topologically adjacent nodes in the network. This actually is very much like the internet. Uh, TCP itself does not uh, operate radios. It doesn't modulate um, uh, data onto uh, uh, fiber optic channels. It relies on underlying protocols 
to uh, to accomplish that that uh, physical uh, transmission of uh, of uh, electronic digital state. Uh, different convergence layer protocols may be used on different segments of the end-to-end -end path to accommodate variations in the network environment. And again, this is just like the internet. Um, you, uh, uh, you you may use uh, Wi-Fi to move data from your phone to your local router. The router then uses uh, perhaps FDDI uh, 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 over um, over optical uh, fiber to move the data to uh, the router of the of the person you want to send data to, possibly through multiple routers, and then that that final uh, local router uh, to the destination might then use Wi-Fi to convey the data. Uh, locally to the uh, to the person you want to send it to. Um, the environment, the expectations of the environment between IP and DTN are quite different. Uh, as, as we've seen before, in, in IP we expect short round trip times. Uh, in DTN we expect long and or variable delays. Uh, that would defeat the internet protocols that, that will rely on quick return of acknowledgments or quick return of data. Client server, negotiation, uh, end to end retransmission, all of these things rely on brief round trip times and all of them are unavailable in the DTN architecture, are assumed to be unavailable until the architecture uh, is, is engineered to not require them. Uh, low error rates are expected in the internet protocol uh, environment. Um, DTN, we expect um, high rates of uh, data loss. Uh, and that's a, a large part of the reason that uh, the retransmission uh, needs to be uh, the responsibility of forwarding nodes inside the network rather than the end node. Um, the if you were, for example, transmitting from uh, Earth to Mars and the, uh, the message is going uh, to um, a, a relay satellite at Mars and, and from there to the, to the ground, on, to the surface of Mars, uh, it would be a, a really bad thing to have the data reach the orbiter and then uh, fail, re fail transmission to the ground and have to be retransmitted from Earth all over again. And because the bit error rates are typically quite high in, um, in interplanetary communications, we could expect that kind of error to occur frequently and, and seriously inhibit communication uh, between the endpoints in the network. Um, in IP, we expect continuous bidirectional end-to-end -end paths. Um, in DTN, we expect intermittent connectivity. It's, it, it's, um, it, it is normal for there to be interruptions in end-to-end -end connectivity between the source and the destination. Uh, and so DTN allows data to be transmitted as soon as there's a, a way to, to move it forward, no matter how far in, in the network. If it only goes one hop, that's fine. It, maybe it goes another hop uh, 10 minutes later after that. And we expect in IP the, the data rates to be more or less symmetric, uh, not necessarily exactly symmetric. Certainly, if your uh, uh, home router is receiving data at, uh, uh, at a rate that is um, 10 or even 100 times higher than, than its transmission rate, that's perfectly within the, the IP envelope. Uh, in space communications, that asymmetry may be several orders higher than that. And the uh, ability of the protocols to tolerate that sort of asymmetry is, um, is, is critical. Um, and, and one other point here uh, is that uh, the DTN bundle protocol uh, runs over convergence layer protocols. Among the convergence layer protocols that it runs over perfectly well is in fact, the existing um, uh, TCP IP environment, the, the Internet Protocol stack. Uh, for data that travels from a point on Earth to a point on Mars and needs to 
uh, go through a ground station on Earth and a relay uh, orbiter uh, at Mars, the, the segment of that end-to-end -end path between the, uh, the, the source uh, laboratory, for example, and, and the, the ground station um, it can easily be uh, a, a TCP IP at, at the convergence layer, and the bundle is, is traveling then uh, in, encapsulated inside TCP IP as it travels from Wisconsin to the ground station. And then it's removed, it's extracted from the, the TCP IP connection, and the same bundle then is packaged in an entirely different way for transmission to Mars using an entirely different set of protocols. Um, some of you who are seeing this may be thinking, uh, how is the difference here between what DTN does and what PEPs, uh, performance enhancing proxies, do? This is a diagram to um, illustrate that uh, a little bit uh, in end to end IP. We've got that at the picture at the top, a very familiar um, uh, hosts with routers in between. If you are, are using a performance enhancing proxy, um, the uh, some of the routers in between the the source and destination hosts, the, the stack goes up a little higher. Instead of stopping at the network layer, it, it extends up to the transport layer, and the and the PEP node will uh, simulate the uh, the receiver's uh, transport um, uh, connection the, the, and, and establish a, a connection locally between the, the source and, uh, and, and the, the proxy. And then um, in the same way that, that, that DTN does, and then uh, replicate that, uh, that, that data flow using a, a, a different flavor of TCP for the space portion of the end-to-end -end, uh, path. And then at the, at the far end, uh, revert back to standard TCP IP uh, for final delivery. The difference here is that um, that the, the, the PEPs will replicate TCP IP uh, at various points in the end-to-end -end path. DTN uh, will, will not do that. It will uh, use TCP IP unaltered and, and very standard vanilla TCP IP where, wherever it can, and it will use quite different protocols for the space link, uh, protocols that are, uh, that are better engineered for the uh, space environment than um, even, even an, an adapted uh, TCP IP can be. And, and so the the same picture that we saw before of uh, comparing end-to-end uh, -end transmission in an IP, TCP IP environment versus a DTN environment appears here and it's, and it's animated for your enjoyment. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, start it moving. Here we see in the, in the IP environment no data could travel until the uh, until quite late in time when uh, the opportunities to transmit data end to end ar arise and there's there's certainly throughput but the latency is very high and the throughput is somewhat limited if we look instead at uh, how this uh, environment would be utilized by dtn we see data moving much earlier in uh, in, in the uh, in period of time that we're studying, and and reaching the final destination uh, much earlier, right about here. And and the throughput is actually higher as well, because there's plenty of time for all the data to get through. So the throughput is higher, the latency is lower, because there's no reliance on uh, continuous end-to-end -end communications. So um, the, the stack is somewhat different for DTN, 
and the difference is that there is this bundle protocol layer that is inserted between the application and the transport. Uh, on Earth, the transport may well be TCP IP. Uh, in space, it may well be uh, a completely different uh, uh, reliability stack that is engineered for the space environment, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the DTN analog to the internet protocol is called bundle protocol. Uh, the standardization of these protocols has been uh, going on for many years. There is a, uh, an internet um, informational RFC, uh, RFC 4838, that uh, introduces the DTN architecture. And uh, there are um, what are called blue books, uh, standards, published standards for uh, bundle protocol that have been published by the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, which is the uh, standards body for uh, spaceflight communications that uh, the, uh, most of the major uh, uh, space networks, uh, uh, national space agencies of the world, adhere to. Uh, features of DTN. Um, DTN was designed for disrupted mobile, airborne, uh, and, and, and other kinds of challenged communication environments. Uh, it has these features. Uh, there's an internet networking layer that is um, functionally analogous to, to the internet protocol, but it's designed to overcome uh, problems that IP itself um, does not overcome intermittent connectivity, long variable delay, asymmetric data rates, high error rates. Uh, it provides um, retransmission inside the network. Uh, there are uh, uh, convergence layer protocol reliability mechanisms th that, um, th that uh, bundle protocol relies on all the time. Uh, when those fail when um, for, for whatever reason uh, a TCP connection fails because a uh, uh, connection gets lost. Um, uh, BP itself will uh, retransmit, will re-forward data uh, possibly on a different convergence layer stack or on a different route. There are uh, routing services that are tolerant of uh, disruption. They take advantage of um, uh, connectivity that is scheduled in addition to current connectivity and they uh, may not uh, need a terrestrial routing infrastructure. Uh, if, if it's there, great, they can use a, a TCP IP. Uh, if it's not there, uh, the BP routing will uh, operate out of its knowledge of the, the, the four-dimensional topology of the network, that is the uh, uh, connectivity among nodes now and uh, and as planned into the future. Uh, there are quality service mechanisms built into DTN. The, uh, there are priorities and, uh, uh, and other quality of service um, indications that give the user some control over the order in which traffic is served by the, the, the uh, internet working layer regardless of the quality service mechanisms of the underlying network segments. There are security features. Security was uh, built into the design thinking of DTN really from the first day. Um, security is not added in as a, uh, as a layer ab above bundle protocol or below bundle protocol. It is built into bundle protocol as, as a uh, as an extension to the bundle protocol header. Uh, the, what this enables is that when bundles are uh, resident in storage in, a, in an intermediary node, uh, they are still secure because the uh, security measures in the bundle protect it not only in transit but also uh, at rest. 
Um, there is a network management system that um, uh, does uh, accounting for uh, traffic passing through the system in, in an asynchronous way, uh, somewhat different from SNMP, uh, that, that can tolerate long network round trip times. Uh, and there is international standardization in IETF and CCSDS. The benefits uh, are these. The DTM store and forward um, mechanism and, and, and uh, its automatic retransmission can give you improved uh, data delivery, which results in improved operations and situational awareness. Uh, there's less need for ground-based commanding. There's m much more recovery from anomalous conditions that uh, occurs inside the network automatically and, and less that uh, needs to be performed by network operators. Uh, interoperability and reuse, uh, the, because the protocol suite is standardized, there is interoperability between international, commercial, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, defense uh, communication assets. Uh, there's an encouragement of commercialization because uh, there's a standardization. It allows NASA to reuse technology to support future missions, which reduces cost. Um, the protocols are, are designed for um, efficient utilization of uh, possibly sparse bandwidth. Um, they uh, also improve um, reliability at a, at a macro level by multiplexing across multiple network paths. Uh, when, the, when the network is deployed, uh, they, uh, there may be multiple ways for data to travel between a spacecraft and, and its destination on Earth. Um, and um, the standardization and interoperability of implementations of delay tolerant networking uh, makes that straightforward. Uh, there's uh, enhanced security, uh, quality of service, uh, uh, as uh, mentioned on the earlier slide, and, um, and, and the advantages of DTN in the space environment uh, actually can pertain to the terrestrial communication environment as well, uh, because there are uh, instances in, in terrestrial communication where um, similarly challenging um, network environments come into um, come into being: uh, disaster management, uh, cave exploration, um, and transmission of of data in uh, parts of the world that have got um, very sparse or, or, or no infrastructure. So we can uh, sort of generalize the idea of solar system internet and, and you know, taking a step back, it actually is uh, an internet of things that, that um, it has to have been an internet of things right from the beginning because there, in most cases there are no people out where these uh, communicating devices are. Um, so when the opportunity to communicate arises, DTN enables uh, automated assured communications among the elements of an Internet of Things that could be the space Internet of Things, but it could equally be an Internet of Things uh, on the terrestrial surface. Um, in addition, as uh, space becomes incre increasingly commercialized, uh, the ability to support uh, high-speed automated communication among a growing number of vehicles in orbit is going to become increasingly important. Um, anything that is um, uh, an element of Internet of Things that doesn't require uh, immediate response is um, a good candidate for, for using DTN. Uh, home automation, trending data. Uh, there is node storage necessary for DTN, but uh, nowadays uh, storage is, is inexpensive and very small devices can uh, conceivably uh, have uh, storage enough to uh, manage a DTN traffic without uh, difficulty.
Uh, other uh, short shore use cases that could benefit from DTN, uh, seagoing vessels, and in particular, um, um, small seagoing vessels and um, uh, buoys and, and such. Radio signals don't travel well through water, and uh, buoys that are in heavy seas have difficulty uh, maintaining connections to satellites uh, because the, the, they're in the troughs of uh, wave systems half the time. Uh, DTN is uh, a good solution for for that kind of uh, highly challenged communication environment. Um, it's uh, you can always or usually solve challenging communication problems by throwing more hardware at it. DTN is, is an alternative to um, deploying more hardware. You can use the available hardware, the available uh, infrastructure, the, the available uh, communication resources uh, more efficiently and more effectively and, um, and, and save some cost and, uh, uh, and leave the, the, the burden of achieving the uh, communication performance that, that's needed for an application uh, to the protocols rather than to the routers. So to summarize what we've talked about, um, we uh, went through a, uh, an overview of space communications um, and then uh, an overview of uh, internet communications and how it relates. Uh, and moving from that to uh, what internet, uh, interplanetary internet would look like and, and how DTN aims to achieve interplanetary internet communications and, and, and what uh, uh, the resulting solar system internet could be. That's, uh, that's all for now. Uh, another segment will be available shortly. Uh, here's a, a picture of uh, an, a uh, deep space internet, a solar system internet that doesn't quite exist yet, but uh, we're hoping. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you.